The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells Chapter 1 The Strange Man's Arrival The stranger came early in February, one wintry day, through a biting wind and a driving snow, the last snowfall of the year, over the down, walking as it seemed from Bramblehurst Railway Station, and carrying a little black portmanteau in his thickly gloved hand. He was wrapped up from head to foot, and the brim of his soft felt had it every inch of his face but the shiny tip of his nose, the snow had piled itself against his shoulders and chest, and added a white crest to the burden he carried. He staggered into the porch and horses, more dead than alive as it seemed, and flung his portmanteau down. A fire, he cried, in the name of human charity. A room and a fire. He stamped and shook the snow from off himself in the bar, and followed Mrs. Hall into her guest parlor to strike his bargain. And with that much introduction, that in a ready acquiescence to terms and a couple of sovereigns flung upon the table, he took up his quarters in the inn. Mrs. Hall lit the fire and left him there while she went to prepare him a meal with her own hands. A guest to stop at Iping in the winter time was an unheard of piece of luck, let alone a guest who was no haggler, and she was resolved to show herself worthy of her good fortune. As soon as the bacon was well underway, and Millie, her lymphatic aide, had been been brisked up a bit by a few deftly chosen expressions of contempt, she carried the cloth, plates, and glasses into the parlor and began to lay them with the utmost eclat. Although the fire was burning up briskly, she was surprised to see that her visitor still wore his hat and coat, standing with his back to her and staring out of the window at the falling snow in the yard. His gloved hands were clasped behind him, and he seemed to be lost in thought. She noticed that the melted snow that still sprinkled his shoulders dripped upon her carpet. Can I take your hat and coat, sir, she said, and give them a good dry in the kitchen? No, he said without turning. She was not sure she had heard him, and was about to repeat her question. He turned his head and looked at her over his shoulder. I prefer to keep them on, he said with emphasis, and she noticed that he wore big blue spectacles with side lights, and had a bushy side whisker over his coat collar that completely hid his cheeks and face. Very well, sir, she said. As you like. In a bit the room will be warmer. He made no answer, and had turned his face away from her again, and Mrs. Hall, feeling that her conversational advances were ill-timed, laid the rest of the table things in a quick staccato and whisked out of the room. When she returned he was still standing there, like a man of stone, his back hunched, his collar turned up, his dripping apron turned down, hiding his face and ears completely. She put down the eggs and bacon with considerable emphasis, and called rather than said to him, your lunch is served, sir. Thank you, he said at the same time, and did not stir until she was closing the door. Then he swung round and approached the table with a certain eager quickness. As she went behind the bar to the kitchen she heard a sound repeated at regular intervals. Chirk, 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 it went, the sound of a spoon being rapidly whisked round a basin. That girl, she said. There. I clean forgot it. It's her being so long. And while she herself finished mixing the mustard, she gave Millie a few verbal stabs for her excessive slowness. She had cooked the ham and eggs, laid the table, and done everything, while Millie, help indeed, had only succeeded in delaying the mustard. And him a new guest and wanting to stay. Then she filled the mustard pot, and, putting it with a certain stateliness upon a gold and black tea tray, carried it into the parlor. She wrapped and entered promptly. As she did so her visitor moved quickly, so that she got but a glimpse of a white object disappearing behind the table. It would seem he was picking something from the floor. She wrapped down the mustard pot on the table, and then she noticed the overcoat and hat had been taken off and put over a chair in front of the fire, and a pair of wet boots threatened rust to her steel fender. She went to these things resolutely. I suppose I may have them to dry now she said in a voice that brooked no denial. 
Leave the hat, said her visitor, in a muffled voice, and turning she saw he had raised his head and was sitting and looking at her for a moment she stooped gaping at him, too surprised to speak. He held a white cloth, it was a serviette he had brought with him over the lower part of his face, so that his mouth and jaws were completely hidden, and that was the reason for his muffled voice. But it was not that which startled Mrs. Hall, it was the fact that all his forehead above his blue glasses was covered by a white bandage, and that another covered his ears, leaving not a scrap of his face exposed excepting only his pink, peak nose. It was bright, pink, and shiny just as it had been at first. He wore a dark brown velvet jacket with a high, black, linen-lined collar turned up about his neck. The thick black hair, escaping as it could below and between the cross bandages, projected in curious tails and horns, giving him the strangest appearance conceivable. This muffled and bandaged head was so unlike what she had anticipated that for a moment she was rigid. He did not remove the serviette, but remained holding it, as she saw now, with a brown gloved hand and regarding her with his inscrutable blue glasses. Leave the hat, he said, speaking very distinctly through the white cloth. Her nerves began to recover from the shock they had received. She placed the hat on the chair again by the fire. I didn't know, sir, she began, that, and she stopped embarrassed. Thank you, he said drily, glancing from her to the door and then at her again I'll have them nicely dried, sir, at once, she said, and carried his clothes out of the room. She glanced at his white suede head and blue goggles again as she was going out the door, but his napkin was still in front of his face. She shivered a little as she closed the door behind her, and her face was eloquent of her surprise and perplexity. I never, she whispered. There. She went quite softly to the kitchen and was too preoccupied to ask Millie what she was messing about with now when she got there. The visitor sat and listened to her retreating feet. He glanced inquiringly at the window before he removed his serviette and resumed his meal. He took a mouthful, glanced suspiciously at the window, took another mouthful, then rose and, taking the serviette in his hand, walked across the room and pulled the blind down to the top of the white muslin that obscured the lower panes. This left the room in a twilight. This done, he returned with an easier air to the table and his meal. The poor souls had an accident or an operation or something, said Mrs. Hall. What turn them bandages to give me, to be sure? She put on some more coal, unfolded the clothes horse, and extended the traveler's coat upon this. And they goggles. Why, he looked more like a divin helmet than a human man. She hung his muffler on a corner of the horse. And holding that handkerchief over his mouth all the time. Talking through it. Perhaps his mouth was hurt too, maybe. She turned round, as one who suddenly remembers. Bless my soul alive, she said, going off at a tangent, ain't you done them tears yet, Millie? When Mrs. Hall went to clear away the stranger's lunch, her idea that his mouth must also have been cut or disfigured in the accident she supposed him to have suffered was confirmed, for he was smoking a pipe, and all the time that she was in the room he never loosened the silk muffler he had wrapped round the lower part of his face to put the mouthpiece to his lips. Yet it was not forgetfulness, for she saw he glanced at it as it smoldered out. He sat in the corner with his back to the window blind and spoke now, having eaten and drunk and been comfortably warmed through, with less aggressive brevity than before. The reflection of the fire lent a kind of red animation to his big spectacles they had lacked hitherto. I have some luggage, he said, at Bramblehurst Station, and he asked her how he could have it sent. He bowed his bandaged head quite politely in acknowledgement of her explanation. Tomorrow, he said. There is no speedier delivery, and seemed quite disappointed when she answered, No. Was she quite sure? No man with a trap who would go over. Mrs. Hall, nothing loath, answered his questions and developed a conversation. It's a steep road by the down, 
sir, she said in answer to the question about a trap, and then, snatching at an opening, said, it was there a carriage was upsettled, a year ago and more, a gentleman killed, besides his coachman. Accidents, sir, happens in a moment, don't they? But the visitor was not to be drawn so easily. They do, he said through his muffler, eyeing her quietly through his impenetrable glasses. But they take long enough to get well, sir, don't they? There was my sister's son, Tom, just cut his arm with a scythe, tumbled on it in the hayfield, and, bless me, he was three months tied up, sir. You hardly believe it. It's regular giving me a dread of a scythe, sir. I can quite understand that, said the visitor. He was afraid, one time, that he'd have to have an operation. He was that bad, sir. The visitor laughed abruptly, a bark of a laugh that he seemed to bite and kill in his mouth. Was he, he said? He was, sir. And no laughing matter to them as had the doing for him, as I had, my sister being took up with her little ones so much. There was bandages to do, sir, and bandages to undo. So that if I may make so bold as to say it, sir, will you give me some matches, said the visitor, quite abruptly. My pipe is out. Mrs. Hall was pulled up suddenly. It was certainly rude of him, after telling him all she had done she gasped at him for a moment and remembered the two sovereigns. She went for the matches. Thanks, he said concisely, as she put them down and turned his shoulder upon her and stared out of the window again. It was altogether too discouraging. Evidently he was sensitive on the topic of operations and bandages. She did not make so bold as to say, however, after all. But his snubbing way had irritated her, and Millie had a hot time of it that afternoon. The visitor remained in the parlor until four o'clock, without giving the ghost of an excuse for an intrusion. For the most part he was quite still during that time, it would seem he sat in the growing darkness smoking in the firelight, perhaps dozing. Once or twice a curious listener might have heard him at the coals, and for the space of five minutes he was audible pacing the room. He seemed to be talking to himself. Then the armchair creaked as he sat down again. Chapter 2 Mr. Teddy Henfrey's First Impressions At four o'clock, when it was fairly dark and Mrs. Hall was screwing up her courage to go in and ask her visitor if he would take some tea, Teddy Henfrey, the clock jobber, came into the bar. My sakes. Mrs. Hall, said he, but this is terrible weather for thin boots. The snow outside was falling faster. Mrs. Hall agreed, and then noticed he had his bag with him. Now you're here, Mr. Teddy, said she, I'd be glad if you give T.H. Old Clock in the parlor a bit of a look. Tis going, and it strikes well and hearty, but the hour hand won't do nothing but point at six. And leading the way, she went across to the parlor door and rapped and entered. Her visitor, she saw as she opened the door, was seated in the armchair before the fire, dozing it would seem, with his bandaged head drooping on one side. The only light in the room was the red glow from the fire, which lit his eyes like adverse railway signals, but left his downcast face in darkness and the scanty vestiges of the day that came in through the open door. Everything was ruddy, shadowy, and indistinct to her, the more so since she had just been lighting the bar lamp and her eyes were dazzled. But for a second it seemed to her that the man she looked at had an enormous mouth wide open, a vast and incredible mouth that swallowed the whole of the lower portion of his face. It was the sensation of a moment, the white bound head, the monstrous goggle eyes, and this huge yawn below it. Then he stirred, started up in his chair, put up his hand. She opened the door wide, so that the room was lighter, and she saw him more clearly, with the muffler held up to his face just as she had seen him hold the serviette before. The shadows, she fancied, had tricked her. Would you mind, sir, this man ain't coming to look at the clock, sir, she said, recovering from the momentary shock. 
Look at the clock, he said, staring round in a drowsy manner and speaking over his hand, and then getting more fully awake, certainly. Mrs. Hall went away to give a lamp, and he rose and stretched himself. Then came the light, and Mr. Teddy Enfry, entering, was confronted by this bandaged person. He was, he says, taken aback. Good afternoon, said the stranger, regarding him, as Mr. Henfry says, with a vivid sense of the dark spectacles, like a lobster. I hope, said Mr. Henfry, that it's no intrusion. None whatever, said the stranger. Though, I understand, he said, turning to Mrs. Hall, that this room is really to be mine for my own private use. I thought, sir, said Mrs. Hall, you prefer the clock, certainly, said the stranger, certainly, but, as a rule, I like to be alone and undisturbed. But I'm really glad to have the clock seen to, he said, seeing a certain hesitation in Mr. Henfrey's manner. Very glad. Mr. Henfry had intended to apologize and withdraw, but this anticipation reassured him. The stranger turned round with his back to the fireplace and put his hands behind his back. And presently, he said, when the clock mending is over, I think I should like to have some tea. But not till the clock mending is over. Mrs. Hall was about to leave the room. She made no conversational advances this time because she did not want to be snubbed in front of Mr. Henfry when her visitor asked her if she had made any arrangements about his boxes at Bramblehurst. She told him she had mentioned the matter to the postman and that the carrier could bring them over on the morrow. You are certain that is the earliest, he said. She was certain with a marked coldness. I should explain, he added, why I was really too cold and fatigued to do before that I am an experimental investigator. Indeed, sir, said Mrs. Hall, much impressed. And my baggage contains apparatus and appliances. Very useful things indeed they are, sir, said Mrs. Hall. And I'm very naturally anxious to get on with my inquiries. Of course, sir. My reason for coming to Iping, he proceeded, with a certain deliberation of manner, was a desire for solitude. I do not wish to be disturbed in my work. In addition to my work and accident, I thought as much, said Mrs. Hall to herself, necessitates a certain retirement. My eyes are sometimes so weak and painful that I have to shut myself up in the dark for hours together lock myself up. Sometimes, now and then. Not at present, certainly. At such times the slightest disturbance, the entry of a stranger into the room, is a source of excruciating annoyance to me, it is well these things should be understood. Certainly, sir, said Mrs. Hall. And if I might make so bold as to ask, that I think, is all, said the stranger, with that quietly irresistible air of finality he could assume at will. Mrs. Hall reserved her question and sympathy for a better occasion. After Mrs. Hall had left the room, he remained standing in front of the fire, glaring, so Mr. Henfry puts it at the clock mending. Mr. Henfry not only took off the hands of the clock and the face, but extracted the works, and he tried to work in as slow and quiet and unassuming a manner as possible. He worked with the lamp close to him, and the green shade threw a brilliant light upon his hands and upon the frame and wheels, and left the rest of the room shadowy. When he looked up, colored patches swam in his eyes. Being constitutionally of a curious nature, he had removed the works, a quite unnecessary proceeding, with the idea of delaying his departure and perhaps falling into conversation with a stranger. But the stranger stood there, perfectly silent and still. So still, he got on Henfrey's nerves. He felt alone in the room and looked up, and there, gray and dim, was the bandaged head and huge blue lenses staring fixedly, with a mist of green spots drifting in front of them. It was so uncanny to Henfry that for a minute they remained staring blankly at one another. Then Henfry looked down again. Very uncomfortable position, 
one would like to say something. Shiki remarked that the weather was very cold for the time of year. He looked up as if to take aim with that introductory shot. The weather, he began. Why don't you finish and go, said the rigid figure, evidently in a state of painfully suppressed rage. All you've got to do is to fix the hour hand on its axle. You're simply humbugging, certainly, sir, one minute more. I overlooked, and Mr. Henfry finished and went. But he went feeling excessively annoyed. Damn it, said Mr. Henfry to himself, trudging down the village through the thawing snow. A man must do a clock at times, sure I'll lie. And again, can a man look at you, ugly? And yet again, seemingly not. If the police was wanting you, you couldn't be more robbed and bandaged. At Gleason's corner, he saw Hall, who had recently married the stranger's hostess at the coach and horses, and who now drove the Iping conveyance when occasional people required it to sit at Bridge Junction, coming towards him on his return from that place. Hall had evidently been stopping a bit at Sitterbridge to judge by his driving. How do, Teddy, he said, passing. You got a rum up home, said Teddy. Hall very sociably pulled up. What's that? he asked. Rum looking customer stopping at the coach and horses, said Teddy. My sakes. And he proceeded to give Hall a vivid description of his grotesque guest. Looks a bit like a disguise, don't it? I'd like to see a man's face if I had him stopping in my place, said Henfry. But women are that trustful, where strangers are concerned. He's took your rooms and he ain't even given a name, Hall. You don't say so, said Hall, who was a man of sluggish apprehension. Yes, said Teddy. By the week. Whatever he is, you can't get rid of him under the week. And he's got a lot of luggage coming tomorrow, so he says. Let's hope it won't be stones and boxes, Hall. He told Hall how his aunt at Hastings had been swindled by a stranger with empty portmanteaus. Altogether, he left Hall vaguely suspicious. Get up, old girl, said Hall. I suppose I must see about this. Teddy trudged on his way with his mind considerably relieved. Instead of seeing about it, however, Hall on his return was severely rated by his wife on the length of time he had spent in Sitterbridge, and his mild inquiries were answered snappishly and in a manner not to the point. But the seed of suspicion Teddy had sown germinated in the mind of Mr. Hall in spite of these discouragements. You then don't know everything, said Mr. Hall, resolved to ascertain more about the personality of his guest at the earliest possible opportunity. And after the stranger had gone to bed, which he did about half past nine, Mr. Hall went very aggressively into the parlor and looked very hard at his wife's furniture, just to show that the stranger wasn't master there, and scrutinized closely and a little contemptuously a sheet of mathematical computations the stranger had left. When retiring for the night, he instructed Mrs. Hall to look very closely at the stranger's luggage when he came next day. You mind your own business, Hall said Mrs. Hall, and I'll mind mine. She was all the more inclined to snap at Hall because the stranger was undoubtedly an unusually strange sort of stranger, and she was by no means assured about him in her own mind. In the middle of the night, she woke up dreaming of huge white heads like turnips that came trailing after her at the end of interminable necks and with vast black eyes. But being a sensible woman, she subdued her terrors and turned over and went to sleep again. Chapter 3 The Thousand and One Bottle So it was that on the 29th day of February, at the beginning of the thaw, this singular person fell out of infinity into Iping Village. Next day his luggage arrived through the slush, and very remarkable luggage it was. There were a couple of trunks indeed, such as a rational man might need, but in addition there were a box of books, big, fat books, of which some were just in an incomprehensible handwriting, and a dozen or more crates, boxes, and cases, containing objects packed in straw, as it seemed to haul, 
tugging with a casual curiosity at the straw, glass bottles. The stranger, muffled in hat, coat, gloves, and wrapper, came out impatiently to meet Fearnside's cart, while Hall was having a word or so of gossip preparatory to helping being them in. Out he came, not noticing Fearnside's dog, who was sniffing in a dilettante spirit at Hall's legs. Come along with those boxes, he said. I've been waiting long enough. And he came down the steps towards the tail of the cart as if to lay hands on the smaller crate. No sooner had Fearnside's dog caught sight of him, however, than it began to bristle and growl savagely, and when he rushed down the steps it gave an undecided hop, and then sprang straight at his hand. Whoop! cried Hall, jumping back, for he was no hero with dogs, and Fearnside howled, lie down, and snatched his whip. They saw the dog's teeth had slipped the hand, heard a kick, saw the dog execute a flanking jump and get home on the stranger's leg, and heard the rip of his trousering. Then the finer end of Fearnside's whip reached his property, and the dog, yelping with dismay, retreated under the wheels of the wagon. It was all the business of a swift half minute. No one spoke, everyone shouted. The stranger glanced swiftly at his torn glove and at his leg, made as if he would stoop to the ladder, then turned and rushed swiftly up the steps into the inn. They heard him go headlong across the passage and up the uncarpeted stairs to his bedroom. You brute, you, said Fear inside, climbing off the wagon with his whip in his hand, while the dog watched him through the wheel. Come here, said Fear inside, you better. Hall had stood gaping. He was bit, said Hall. I'd better go and see the inn, and he trotted after the stranger. He met Mrs. Hall in the passage. Carrier's dark, he said bit in. He went straight upstairs, and the stranger's door being ajar, he pushed it open and was entering without any ceremony, being of a naturally sympathetic turn of mind. The blind was down and the room dim. He caught a glimpse of a most singular thing, what seemed a handless arm waving towards him, and a face of three huge indeterminate spots on white, very like the face of a pale pansy. Then he was struck violently in the chest, hurled back, and the door slammed in his face and locked. It was so rapid that it gave him no time to observe. A waving of indecipherable shapes, a blow, and a concussion. There he stood on the dark little landing, wondering what it might be that he had seen. A couple of minutes after, he rejoined the little group that had formed outside the coach and horses. There was fear inside telling about it all over again for the second time, there was Mrs. Hall saying his dog didn't have no business to bite her guests, there was Huckster, the general dealer from over the road, interrogative, and Sandy Watchers from the forge, judicial, besides women and children, all of them saying fatuities, wouldn't let him bite me, I knows, Taz and Wright have such darks, what he buy in for, then, and so forth. Mr. Hall, staring at them from the steps and listening, found it incredible that he had seen anything so very remarkable happen upstairs. Besides, his vocabulary was altogether too limited to express his impressions. He don't want no help, he says, he said in answer to his wife's inquiry. We better be a keen of his luggage in. He ought to have it cauterized at once, said Mr. Huckster, especially if it's at all inflamed. I'd shoot in, that's what I'd do, said a lady in the group. Suddenly the dog began growling again. Come along, cried an angry voice in the doorway, and there stood the muffled stranger with his collar turned up and his hat brim bent down. The sooner you get those things in the better I'll be pleased. It is stated by an anonymous bystander that his trousers and gloves had been changed. Was you hurt, sir? said Fear inside. I'm rare sorry the dark, not a bit, said the stranger. Never broke the skin. Hurry up with those things. He then swore to himself, so Mr. Hall asserts. Directly the first crate was, in accordance with his directions, carried into the parlor, the stranger flung himself upon it with extraordinary eagerness, 
and began to unpack it, scattering the straw with an utter disregard of Mrs. Hall's carpet. And from it he began to produce bottles, little fat bottles containing powders, small and slender bottles containing colored and white fluids, fluted blue bottles labeled poison, bottles with round bodies and slender necks, large green glass bottles, large white glass bottles, bottles with glass stoppers and frosted labels, bottles with fine corks, bottles with bongs, bottles with wooden caps, wine bottles, salad oil bottles, putting them in rows on the chiffonier, on the mantel, on the table, under the window, round the floor, on the bookshelf, everywhere. The chemist's shop in Bramblehurst could not boast half so many. Quite a sight it was. Crate after crate yielded bottles, until all six were empty and the table high with straw. The only things that came out of these crates besides the bottles were a number of test tubes and a carefully packed balance. And directly the crates were unpacked. The stranger went to the window and set to work, not troubling in the least about the litter of straw, the fire which had gone out, the box of books outside, nor for the trunks and other luggage that had gone upstairs. When Mrs. Hall took his dinner into him, he was already so absorbed in his work, pouring little drops out of the bottles into test tubes, that he did not hear her until she had swept away the bulk of the straw and put the tray on the table, with some little emphasis perhaps, seeing the state that the floor was in. Then he half turned his head and immediately turned it away again. But she saw he had removed his glasses, they were beside him on the table, and it seemed to her that his eye sockets were extraordinarily hollow. He put on his spectacles again, and then turned and faced her. She was about to complain of the straw on the floor when he anticipated her. I wish you wouldn't come in without knocking, he said in the tone of abnormal exasperation that seemed so characteristic of him. I knocked, but seemingly, perhaps you did. But in my investigations, my really very urgent and necessary investigations, the slightest disturbance, the jar of a door, I must ask you, certainly, sir. You can turn the lock if you're like that, you know. Any time. A very good idea, said the stranger. This Strayer, sir, if I might make so bold as to remark, don't. If the straw makes trouble, put it down in the bill. And he mumbled at her, words suspiciously like curses. He was so odd, standing there, so aggressive and explosive, bottle in one hand and test tube in the other, that Mrs. Hall was quite alarmed. But she was a resolute woman. In which case, I should like to know, sir, what you consider a shilling, put down a shilling. Surely a shilling's enough? So be it, said Mrs. Hall taking up the tablecloth and beginning to spread it over the table. If you're satisfied, of course, he turned and sat down with his coat collar toward her. All the afternoon he worked with the door locked and, as Mrs. Hall testifies, for the most part in silence. But once there was a concussion and a sound of bottles ringing together as though the table had been hit and the smash of a bottle flung violently down and then a rapid pacing athwart the room. Fearing something was the matter, she went to the door and listened, not caring to knock. I can't go on, he was raving. I can't go on. Three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. The huge multitude. Cheated. All my life it may take me. Patience. Patience indeed. Fool. Fool. There was a noise of hobnails on the bricks in the bar, and Mrs. Hall had very reluctantly to leave the rest of his soliloquy. When she returned the room was silent again, save for the faint crepitation of his chair and the occasional clink of a bottle. It was all over, the stranger had resumed work. When she took in his tea she saw broken glass in the corner of the room under the concave mirror and a golden stain that had been carelessly wiped. She called attention to it. Put it down in the bill, snapped her visitor. For God's sake, don't worry me. If there's damage done, put it down in the bill, and he went on ticking a list in the exercise book before him. I'll tell you something, 
said Fearon's side, mysteriously. It was late in the afternoon, and they were in the little beer shop of Iping Hanger. Well, said Teddy and Fry, this chap you're speaking of, what my dog bit. Well, he's black. Leastways, his legs are. I see through the tear of his trousers and the tear of his glove. You'd have expected a sort of pinky to show, wouldn't you? Well, there wasn't none. Just blackness. I tell you, he's as black as my hat. My sakes, said Anne Fry. It's a rummy case altogether. Why, his nose is as pink as paint. That's true, said Fear inside. I knows that. And I tell ye what I'm thinking. That Marn's a piebald, Teddy. Black here and white there, in patches. And he's ashamed of it. He's a kind of half-breed, and the colors come off patchy instead of mixing. I've heard of such things before. And it's the common way with horses, as anyone can see. Chapter 4 Mr. Cuss interviews the stranger. I have told the circumstances of the stranger's arrival and I being with a certain fullness of detail in order that the curious impression he created may be understood by the reader. But excepting two odd incidents, the circumstances of his stay until the extraordinary day of the club festival may be passed over very cursorily. There were a number of skirmishes with Mrs. Hall on matters of domestic discipline, but in every case until late April, when the first signs of penury began, he overrode her by the easy expedient of an extra payment. Hall did not like him, and whenever he dared he talked of the advisability of getting rid of him, but he showed his dislike chiefly by concealing it ostentatiously and avoiding his visitor as much as possible. Wait till the summer, said Mrs. Hall sagely, when the artists are beginning to come. Then we'll see. He may be a bit overbearing, but Bill's settle punctual is Bill's settle punctual, whatever you'd like to say. The stranger did not go to church, and indeed made no difference between Sunday and the irreligious days, even in costume. He worked, as Mrs. Hall thought, very fitfully. Some days he would come down early and be continuously busy. On others he would rise late, pace his room, fretting audibly for hours together, smoke, sleep in the armchair by the fire. Communication with the world beyond the village he had none. His temper continued very uncertain, for the most part his manner was that of a man suffering under almost unendurable provocation, and once or twice things were snapped, torn, crushed, or broken in spasmodic gusts of violence. He seemed under a chronic irritation of the greatest intensity. His habit of talking to himself in a low voice grew steadily upon him, but though Mrs. Hall listened conscientiously she could make neither head nor tail of what she heard. He rarely went abroad by daylight, but at twilight he would go out muffled up invisibly, whether the weather were cold or not, and he chose the loneliest paths and those most overshadowed by trees and banks. His gobbling spectacles and ghastly bandaged face under the penthouse of his hat came with a disagreeable suddenness out of the darkness upon one or two ongoing laborers and Teddy and Fry, tumbling out of the scarlet coat one night at half past nine, was scared shamefully by the stranger's skull-like head he was walking hat in hand, lit by the sudden light of the opened in door. Such children as saw him at nightfall dreamt of bogies, and it seemed doubtful whether he disliked boys more than they disliked him, with a reverse, but there was certainly a vivid enough dislike on either side. It was inevitable that a person of so remarkable an appearance and bearing should form a frequent topic in such a village as Iping. Opinion was greatly divided about his occupation. Mrs. Hall was sensitive on the point. When questioned, she explained very carefully that he was an experimental investigator, going gingerly over the syllables as one who dreads pitfalls. When asked what an experimental investigator was, she would say with a touch of superiority that most educated people knew such things as that, and would thus explain that he discovered things. Her visitor had had an accident, she said, which temporarily discolored his face and hands, 
and being of a sensitive disposition, he was averse to any public notice of the fact. Out of her hearing there was a view largely entertained that he was a criminal trying to escape from justice by wrapping himself up so as to conceal himself altogether from the eye of the police. This idea sprang from the brain of Mr. Teddy Henfry. No crime of any magnitude dating from the middle or end of February was known to have occurred. Elaborated in the imagination of Mr. Gould, the probationary assistant in the National School, this theory took the form that the stranger was an anarchist in disguise, preparing explosives, and he resolved to undertake such detective operations as his time permitted. These consisted for the most part in looking very hard at the stranger whenever they met, or in asking people who had never seen the stranger, leading questions about him. But he detected nothing another school of opinion followed Mr. Fearnside, and either accepted the piebald view or some modification of it, as, for instance, Silas Durgan, who was heard to assert that if he chose us to show himself at fairs he'd make his fortune in no time, and being a bit of a theologian, compared the stranger to the man with the one talent. Yet another view explained the entire matter by regarding the stranger as a harmless lunatic. That had the advantage of accounting for everything straight away. Between these main groups there were waverers and compromisers. Sussex folk have few superstitions, and it was only after the events of early April that the thought of the supernatural was first whispered in the village. Even then it was only credited among the women folk. But whatever they thought of him, people on Iping, on the whole, agreed in disliking him. His irritability, though it might have been comprehensible to an urban brain worker, was an amazing thing to these quiet Sussex villagers. The frantic gesticulations they surprised now and then, the headlong pace after nightfall that swept him upon them round quiet corners, the inhuman bludgeoning of all tentative advances of curiosity, the taste for twilight that led to the closing of doors, the pulling down of blinds, the extinction of candles and lamps, who could agree with such goings on? They drew aside as he passed down the village, and when he had gone by, young humorists would up with coat collars and down with hat brims, and go pacing nervously after him in imitation of his occult bearing. There was a song popular at that time called The Bogeyman. Miss Statchel sang it at the schoolroom concert, in aid of the church lamps, and thereafter whenever one or two of the villagers were gathered together and the stranger appeared, a bar or so of this tune, more or less sharp or flat, was whistled in the midst of them. Also belated little children would call Bogeyman after him and make off tremulously elated. Cuss, the general practitioner, was devoured by curiosity. The bandages excited his professional interest, the report of the thousand and one bottles aroused his jealous regard. All through April and May he coveted an opportunity of talking to the stranger, and at last, towards Whitsuntide, he could stand it no longer, but hit upon the subscription list for a village nurse as an excuse. He was surprised to find that Mr. Hall did not know his guest's name. He gave a name, said Mrs. Hall, an assertion which was quite unfounded, but I didn't rightly hear it. She thought it seemed so silly not to know the man's name. Cuss rapped at the parlor door and entered. There was a fairly audible imprecation from within. Pardon my intrusion, said Cuss, and then the door closed and cut Mrs. Hall off from the rest of the conversation. She could hear the murmur of voices for the next ten minutes, then a cry of surprise, a stirring of feet, a chair flung aside, a bark of laughter, quick steps to the door, and Cuss appeared, his face white, his eyes staring over his shoulder. He left the door open behind him, and without looking at her strode across the hall and went down the steps, and she heard his feet hurrying along the road. He carried his hat in his hand. She stood behind the door, looking at the open door of the parlor. Then she heard the stranger laughing quietly, and then his footsteps came across the room. She could not see his face where she stood. The parlor door slammed, and the place was silent again. Cuss went straight up the village to bunting the vicar. Am I mad? Cuss began abruptly as he entered the shabby little study. 
Do I look like an insane person? What's happened, said the vicar, putting the ammonite on the loose sheets of his forthcoming sermon. That chap at the inn, well? Give me something to drink, said Cuss, and he sat down. When his nerves had been steadied by a glass of cheap sherry, the only drink the good vicar had available, he told him of the interview he had just had. When in, he gasped and began to demand a subscription for the nurse fund. He'd stuck his hands in his pockets as I came in, and he sat down lumpily in his chair. Sniffed. I told him I'd heard he took an interest in scientific things. He said yes. Sniffed again. Kept on sniffing all the time, evidently recently caught an infernal cold. No wonder, wrapped up like that. I developed the nurse idea, and all the while kept my eyes open. Bottles, chemicals, everywhere. Balance, test tubes and stands, and a smell of evening primrose. Would he subscribe? Said he'd consider it. Asked him, point blank, was he researching? Said he was. A long research? Got quite cross. A damnable long research, said he, blowing the cork out, so to speak. Oh, said I. And out came the grievance. The man was just on the boil, and my question boiled him over. He had been given a prescription, most valuable prescription, what for he wouldn't say. Was it medical? Damn you. What are you fishing after? I apologized. Dignified sniff and cough. He resumed. He'd read it. Five ingredients. Put it down, turned his head. Draft of air from window lifted the paper. Swish, Russell. He was working in a room with an open fireplace, he said. Saw a flicker, and there was the prescription burning and lifting chimney ward. Rushed towards it just as it whisked up the chimney. So, just at that point, to illustrate his story, out came his arm. Well, no hand, just an empty sleeve. Lord, I thought, that's a deformity. Got cork arm, I suppose, and has taken it off. Then, I thought, there's something on in that. What the devil keeps that sleeve up and open if there's nothing in it? There was nothing in it, I tell you. Nothing down it, right down to the joint. I could see right down into the elbow, and there was a glimmer of light shining through a tear of the cloth. Good God. I said. Then he stopped. Stared at me with those black goggles of his, and then at his sleeve. Well... That's all. He never said a word, just glared, and put his sleeve back in his pocket quickly. I was saying, said he, that there was the prescription burning, wasn't I? Interrogative cough. How the devil, said I, can you move an empty sleeve like that? Empty sleeve? Yes, said I, an empty sleeve. It's an empty sleeve, is it? You saw it was an empty sleeve? He stood up right away. I stood up too. He came towards me in three very slow steps and stood quite close. Sniffed venomously. I didn't flinch, though I'm hanged if that bandaged knob of his and those blinkers aren't enough to unnerve anyone coming quietly up to you. You said it was an empty sleeve, he said. Certainly, I said. At staring and saying nothing a bare-faced man, unspectacled, starts scratch. Then very quietly he pulled his sleeve out of his pocket again and raised his arm towards me as though he would show it to me again. He did it very, very slowly. I looked at it. Seemed an age. Well, said I, clearing my throat, there's nothing in it. Had to say something. I was beginning to feel frightened. I could see right down it. He extended it straight towards me, slowly, 
slowly, just like that, until the cuff was six inches from my face. Queer thing to see an empty sleeve come at you like that. And then, well, something exactly like a finger and thumb it felt nipped my nose. Bunting began to laugh. There wasn't anything there, said Cuss, his voice running up into a shriek at the there. It's all very well for you to laugh, but I tell you I was so startled, I hit his cuff hard and turned around and cut out of the room, I left him, Cuss stopped. There was no mistaking the sincerity of his panic. He turned round in a helpless way and took a second glass of the excellent Vickers very inferior sherry. When I hit his cuff, said Cuss, I tell you, it felt exactly like hitting an arm. And there wasn't an arm. There wasn't the ghost of an arm. Mr. Bunting thought it over. He looked suspiciously at Cuss. It's a most remarkable story, he said. He looked very wise and grave indeed. It's really, said Mr. Bunting with judicial emphasis, a most remarkable story. Chapter 5 The Burglary at the Vicarage The facts of the burglary at the vicarage came to us chiefly through the medium of the vicar and his wife. It occurred in the small hours of Wood Monday, the day devoted in hyping to the club festivities. Mrs. Bunting, it seems, woke up suddenly in the stillness that comes before the dawn with the strong impression that the door of their bedroom had opened and closed. She did not arouse her husband at first, but sat up in bed listening. She then distinctly heard the pad, pad, pad of bare feet coming out of the adjoining dressing room and walking along the passage towards the staircase. As soon as she felt assured of this, she aroused the Reverend Mr. Bunting as quietly as possible. He did not strike a light, but putting on his spectacles, her dressing gown and his bath slippers, he went out on the landing to listen. He heard quite distinctly a fumbling going on at his study desk downstairs and then a violent sneeze. At that he returned to his bedroom, armed himself with the most obvious weapon, the poker, and descended the staircase as noiselessly as possible. Mrs. Bunting came out on the landing. The hour was about four, and the ultimate darkness of the night was past. There was a faint shimmer of light in the hall, but the study doorway yawned impenetrably black. Everything was still except the faint creaking of the stairs under Mr. Bunting's tread and the slight movements in the study. Then something snapped, the drawer was opened, and there was a rustle of papers. Then came an imprecation, and a match was struck and the study was flooded with yellow light. Mr. Bunting was now in the hall and through the crack of the door he could see the desk and the open drawer and a candle burning on the desk. But the robber he could not see. He stood there in the hall undecided what to do and Mrs. Bunting, her face white and intent, crept slowly downstairs after him. One thing kept Mr. Bunting's courage the persuasion that this burglar was a resident in the village. They heard the chink of money and realized that the robber had found the housekeeping reserve of gold, two pounds ten and half sovereigns altogether. At that sound Mr. Bunting was near to abrupt action. Gripping the poker firmly, he rushed into the room, closely followed by Mrs. Bunting. Surrender, cried Mr. Bunting, fiercely, and then stooped amazed. Apparently, the room was perfectly empty. Yet their conviction that they had, that very moment, heard somebody moving in the room had amounted to a certainty. For half a minute, perhaps, they stood gaping, then Mrs. Bunting went across the room and looked behind the screen, while Mr. Bunting, by a kindred impulse, peered under the desk. Then Mrs. Bunting turned back the window curtains, and Mr. Bunting looked up the chimney and probed it with a poker. Then Mrs. Bunting scrutinized the waste paper basket and Mr. Bunting opened the lid of the coal scuttle. Then they came to a stop and stood with eyes interrogating each other. I could have sworn, said Mr. Bunting. The candle, said Mr. Bunting. Who lit the candle? The drawer, said Mrs. Bunting. And the money's gone. She went hastily to the doorway 
Of all the strange occurrences, there was a violent sneeze in the passage. They rushed out, and as they did so the kitchen door slammed. Bring the candle, said Mr. Bunting, and led the way. They both heard a sound of bolts being hastily shot back. As he opened the kitchen door he saw through the scullery that the back door was just opening and the faint light of early dawn displayed the dark masses of the garden beyond. He is certain that nothing went out of the door. It opened, stood open for a moment, and then closed with a slam. As it did so, the candle Mrs. Bunting was carrying from the study flickered and flared. It was a minute or more before they entered the kitchen. The place was empty. They refastened the back door, examined the kitchen, pantry, and scullery thoroughly, and at last went down into the cellar. There was not a soul to be found in the house, search as they would. Daylight found the vicar and his wife, a quaintly costumed little couple, still marveling about on their own ground floor by the unnecessary light of a guttering candle. Chapter 6 The Furniture That Went Mad Now it happened that in the early hours of Wood Monday, before Millie was hunted out for the day, Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly down into the cellar. Their business there was of a private nature and had something to do with the specific gravity of their beer. They had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joy room. As she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went on into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed. But returning with the bottle, he noticed that the bolts of the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch. And with a flash of inspiration he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestions of Mr. Teddy Henfry. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot these bolts overnight. At the sight he stopped, gaping, then with the bottle still in his hand went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again, then pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments, the only garments so far as he knew, and the bandages of their guest. His big slouch hat even was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depth of the cellar, with that rapid telescoping of the syllables and interrogative cocking up of the final words to a high note, by which the West Sussex villager is wont to indicate a brisk impatience. George, you got what a wand? At that he turned and hurried down to her. Jenny, he said, over the rail of the cellar steps, T.S. the truth what Enfry says. He's not in UZ room yet and the front doors unbolted. At first Mrs. Hall did not understand, and as soon as she did she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall, still holding the bottle, went first. If he ain't there, he said, his clothes are. And what's he doing if out his clothes, then? Ta's a most curious business. As they came up the cellar steps they both, it was afterwards ascertained, fancied they heard the front door open and shut, but seeing it closed and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought that he heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and stood regarding the room. Of all the curious, she said. She heard a sniff close behind her head as it seemed, and turning, was surprised to see Hall a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. But in another moment he was beside her. She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow and then under the clothes. Cold, she said. 
he's been up this hour or more. As she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. The bedclothes gathered themselves together, leapt up suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the center and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat hopped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through the better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs. Hull's face. Then as swiftly came the sponge from the washstand, and then the chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside, and laughing drilly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its four legs at Mrs. Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be executing a dance of triumph for a moment, and then abruptly everything was still. Mrs. Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr. Hall's arms on the landing. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr. Hall and Millie, who had been roused by her scream of alarm, succeeded in getting her downstairs and applying the restoratives customary in such cases. Ta's spirits, said Mrs. Hall. I know T.S. spirits. I've read in papers of N. Tables and chairs leaping and dancing. Take a drop more, Jenny, said Hall. Twill steady ye. Lock him out, said Mrs. Hall. Don't let him come in again. I half guessed, I might have known. With them gobbling eyes and bandaged head, and never going to church of a Sunday. And all they bottles, more in its right for anyone to have. He's put the spirits into the furniture. My good old furniture. Twas in that very chair my poor dear mother used to sit when I was a little girl. To think it should rise up against me now. Just to drop more, Jenny, said Hall. Your nerves is all upset. They sent Millie across the street through the golden five o'clock sunshine to rouse up Mr. Sandy Watchers, the blacksmith. Mr. Hall's compliments and the furniture upstairs was behaving most extraordinary. Would Mr. Watchers come round? He was a knowing man, was Mr. Watchers, and very resourceful. He took quite a grave view of the case. Arm darned if that in witchcraft was the view of Mr. Sandy Watchers. You worn horseshoes for such gentry as he. He came round greatly concerned. They wanted him to lead the way upstairs to the room, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry. He preferred to talk in the passage. Over the way Huckster's apprentice came out and began taking down the shutters of the tobacco window. He was called over to join the discussion. Mr. Huckster naturally followed over in the course of a few minutes. The Anglo-Saxon genius for parliamentary government asserted itself. There was a great deal of talk and no decisive action. Let's have the facts first, insisted Mr. Sandy Watchers. Let's be sure we be acting perfectly right in Buston that their door open. A door on bust is always open to Buston, but you can't on bust a door once you've busted in. And suddenly and most wonderfully the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord, and as they looked up in amazement, they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger staring more blackly and blankly than ever with those unreasonably large blue glass eyes of his. He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. He walked across the passage staring, then stopped. Look there, he said, and their eyes followed the direction of his gloved finger and saw a bottle of sarsaparilla heart by the cellar door. Then he entered the parlor and suddenly, swiftly, viciously slammed the door in their faces. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. Well, if that don't lick everything, said Mr. Watchers, and left the alternative unsaid. I'd go in and ask him about it, said Watchers, to Mr. Hall. I'd demand an explanation. It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he rapped, 
opened the door, and got as far as, Excuse me, go to the devil, said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and shut that door after you. So that brief interview terminated. Chapter 7 The Unveiling of the Stranger The stranger went into the little parlor of the coach and horses about half past five in the morning, and there he remained until near midday, the blinds down, the door shut, and none, after Hall's repulse, venturing near him. All that time he must have fasted. Thrice he rang his bell, the third time furiously and continuously, but no one answered him. Him and his go to the devil indeed, said Mrs. Hall. Presently came an imperfect rumor of the burglary at the vicarage, and two and two were put together. Hall, assisted by watchers, went off to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, and take his advice. No one ventured upstairs. How the stranger occupied himself is unknown. Now and then he would stride violently up and down, and twice came an outburst of curses, a tearing of paper, and a violent smashing of bottles. The little group of scared but curious people increased. Mrs. Huckster came over, some gay young fellows resplendent in black ready-made jackets and peak paper ties, for it was Wood Monday, joined the group with confused interrogations. Young Archie Harker distinguished himself by going up the yard and trying to peep under the window blinds. He could see nothing, but gave reason for supposing that he did, and others of the Iping youth presently joined him. It was the finest of all possible Wood Mondays, and down the village street stood a row of nearly a dozen booths, a shooting gallery, and on the grass by the forge were three yellow and chocolate wagons and some picturesque strangers of both sexes putting up a coconut shy. The gentlemen wore blue jerseys, the ladies white aprons and quite fashionable hats with heavy plumes. Roger, of the purple fawn, and Mr. Jaggers, the cobbler, who also sold old second-hand ordinary bicycles, were stretching a string of Union Jacks and Royal Ensigns, which had originally celebrated the first Victorian Jubilee, across the road. And inside, in the artificial darkness of the parlor, into which only one thin jet of sunlight penetrated, the stranger, hungry we must suppose, and fearful, hidden in his uncomfortable hot wrappings, poured through his dark glasses upon his paper or chinked his dirty little bottles, and occasionally swore savagely at the boys, audible if invisible, outside the windows. In the corner by the fireplace lay the fragments of half a dozen smashed bottles, and a pungent twang of chlorine tainted the air. So much we know from what was heard at the time and from what was subsequently seen in the room. About noon he suddenly opened his parlor door and stood glaring fixedly at the three or four people in the bar. Mrs. Hall, he said. Somebody went sheepishly and called for Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared after an interval, a little short of breath, but all the fiercer for that. Hall was still out. She had deliberated over this scene and she came holding a little tray with an unsettled bill upon it. Is it your bill you're wanting, sir? She said. Why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating? Why isn't my bill paid? Said Mrs. Hall. That's what I want to know. I told you three days ago I was awaiting a remittance. I told you two days ago I wasn't going to await no remittances. You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit. If my bill's been waiting these five days, can you? The stranger swore briefly but vividly. N.A.R., N.A.R., from the bar. And I thank you kindly, sir, if you keep your swearing to yourself, sir, said Mrs. Hall. The stranger stood looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs. Hall had the better of him. His next words showed as much. Look here, my good woman, he began. Don't good woman me, said Mrs. Hall. I've told you my remittance hasn't come. Remittance indeed, said Mrs. Hall. Still, I dare say in my pocket, you told me three days ago that you hadn't anything but a sovereign's worth of silver upon you. 
Well, I found some more, hello, from the bar. I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall. That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. He stamped his foot. What do you mean, he said. That I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall. And before I take any bills or get any breakfasts or do any such things whatsoever, you got to tell me one or two things I don't understand and what nobody don't understand and what everybody is very anxious to understand. I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs and I want to know how tis your room was empty and how you got in again. Then this stops and this house comes in by the doors, that's the rule of the house and that you didn't do and what I want to know is how you did come in. And I want to know, suddenly the stranger raised his gloved hands clenched, stamped his foot and said, stop, with such extraordinary violence that he silenced her instantly. You don't understand, he said, who I am or what I am. I'll show you. By heaven. I'll show you. Then he put his open palm over his face and withdrew it. The center of his face became a black cavity. Here, he said. He stepped forward and handed Mrs. Hall something which she, staring at his metamorphosed face, accepted automatically. Then, when she saw what it was, she screamed loudly, dropped it, and staggered back. The nose, it was the stranger's nose. Pink and shining, rolled on the floor. Then he removed his spectacles, and everyone in the bar gasped. He took off his hat, and with a violent gesture tore at his whiskers and bandages. For a moment they resisted him. A flash of horrible anticipation passed through the bar. Oh, my guard, said someone. Then off they came. It was worse than anything. Mrs. Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw and made for the door of the house. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, disfigurements, tangible horrors, but nothing. The bandages and false hair flew across the passage into the bar, making a hobbledehoy jump to avoid them. Everyone tumbled on everyone else down the steps. For the man who stood there shouting some incoherent explanation was a solid gesticulating figure up to the coat collar of him and then nothingness, no visible thing at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks and looking up the street saw the coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. They saw Mrs. Hall fall down and Mr. Teddy Enfry jump to avoid tumbling over her and then they heard the frightful screams of Millie who, emerging suddenly from the kitchen at the noise of the tumult, had come upon the headless stranger from behind. These increased suddenly. Forthwith everyone all down the street, the sweet stuff seller, coconut shy proprietor and his assistant, the swing man, little boys and girls, rustic dandies, smart wenches, smocked elders and apron gypsies, began running towards the inn and in a miraculously short space of time a crowd of perhaps 40 people and rapidly increasing swayed and hooted and inquired and exclaimed and suggested in front of Mrs. Hall's establishment. Everyone seemed eager to talk at once and the result was babble. A small group supported Mrs. Hall who was picked up in a state of collapse. There was a conference and the incredible evidence of a vociferous eyewitness. Oh, bogey. What's he been doing, then? Ain't hurt the girl, has he? Run in with a knife, I believe. No, Ed, I tell ye. I don't mean no manner of speaking. I mean more than thou, Ed. Nonsense, tis some conjuring trick. Fetched off his wrapping, he did, in its struggles to see in through the open door, the crowd formed itself into a straggling wedge with the more adventurous apex nearest the end. He stood for a moment, I heard the gal scream, and he turned. I saw her skirts whisk, and he went after her. Didn't take ten seconds. Back he comes with a knife and easy hand and a loaf, stood just as if he was staring. Not a moment ago, within that there door, I tell ye, 
he ain't Cartnellan at all. He just missed in, there was a disturbance behind, and the speaker stopped to step aside for a little procession that was marching very resolutely towards the house. First Mr. Hall, very red and determined, then Mr. Bobby Jaffers, the village constable, and then the wary Mr. Watchers. They had come now armed with a warrant. People shouted conflicting information of the recent circumstances. Ed or no Ed, said Jaffers, I got to rest in, and rest in I will. Mr. Hall marched up the steps, marched straight to the door of the parlor and flung it open. Constable, he said, to your duty. Jaffers marched in. Hall next, Watchers last. They saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them with a gnawed crust of bread in one gloved hand and a chunk of cheese in the other. That's him, said Hall. What the devil's this, came in a tone of angry expostulation from above the collar of the figure. You're a damned rum customer, mister, said Mr. Jaffers. But Ed or no Ed, the warrant says body and duty's duty, keep off, said the figure, starting back. Abruptly he whipped down the bread and cheese, and Mr. Hall just grasped the knife on the table in time to save it. Off came the stranger's left glove and was slapped in Jaffers' face. In another moment Jaffers, cutting short some statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a sounding kick on the shin that made him shout, but he kept his grip. Hall sent the knife sliding along the table to Watchers, who acted as goalkeeper for the offensive, so to speak, and then stepped forward as Jaffers and the stranger swayed and staggered towards him, clutching and hitting in. A chair stood in the way, and went aside with a crash as they came down together. Get the feet, said Jaffers between his teeth. Mr. Hall, endeavoring to act on instructions, received a sounding kick in the ribs that disposed of him for a moment, and Mr. Watchers, seeing the decapitated stranger had rolled over and got the upper side of Jaffers, retreated towards the door, knife in hand, and so collided with Mr. Huckster and the Sitterbridge Carter coming to the rescue of law and order. At the same moment down came three or four bottles from the chiffonier and shot a web of pungency into the air of the room. I'll surrender, cried the stranger, though he had Jaffers down, and in another moment he stood up panting, a strange figure, headless and handless, for he had pulled off his right glove now as well as his left. It's no good, he said, as if sobbing for breath. It was the strangest thing in the world to hear that voice coming as if out of empty space, but the Sussex peasants are perhaps the most matter-of-fact people under the sun. Jaffers got up also and produced a pair of handcuffs. Then he stared. I say, said Jaffers, brought up short by a dim realization of the incongruity of the whole business. Darn it. Can't use him as I can see. The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and as if by a miracle the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. Then he said something about his shin and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. Why, said Huckster, suddenly, that's not a man at all. It's just empty clothes. Look, you can see down his collar and the linings of his clothes. I could put my arm, he extended his hand, it seemed to meet something in midair, and he drew it back with a sharp exclamation. I wish you'd keep your fingers out of my eye, said the aerial voice, in a tone of savage expostulation. The fact is, I'm all here, head, hands, legs, and all the rest of it, but it happens I'm invisible. It's a confounded nuisance, but I am. That's no reason why I should be poked to pieces by every stupid bumpkin and iping, is it? The suit of clothes, now all unbuttoned and hanging loosely upon its unseen supports, stood up, arms akimbo. Several other of the men folks had now entered the room, so that it was closely crowded. Invisible, eh, said Huckster, ignoring the stranger's abuse. Who ever heard the likes of that? It's strange, perhaps, but it's not a crime. Why am I assaulted by a policeman in this fashion?
Oh, that's a different matter, said Jaffers. No doubt you are a bit difficult to see in this light, but I got a warrant and it's all correct. What I'm after ain't no invisibility, it's burglary. There's a house been broke into and money took. Well, and circumstances certainly point stuff and nonsense, said the invisible man. I hope so, sir, but I've got my instructions. Well, said the stranger, I'll come. I'll come. But no handcuffs. It's the regular thing, said Jaffers. No handcuffs, stipulated the stranger. Pardon me, said Jaffers. Abruptly the figure sat down, and before anyone could realize what was being done, the slippers, socks, and trousers had been kicked off under the table. Then he sprang up again and flung off his coat. Here, stop that, said Jaffers, suddenly realizing what was happening. He gripped at the waistcoat, it struggled, and the shirt slipped out of it and left it limply and empty in his hand. Hold him, said Jaffers, loudly. Once he gets the things off, hold him, cried everyone, and there was a rush at the fluttering white shirt which was now all that was visible of the stranger. The shirt sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his open-armed advance and sent him backward into Old Tooth's and the sexton, and in another moment the garment was lifted up and became convulsed and vacantly flapping about the arms, even as a shirt that is being thrust over a man's head. Jaffers clutched at it and only helped to pull it off. He was struck in the mouth out of the air and incontinently threw his truncheon and smote Teddy Henfry savagely upon the crown of his head. Look out, said everybody, fencing at random and hitting at nothing. Hold him. Shut the door. Don't let him loose. I got something. Here he is. A perfect babble of noises they made. Everybody, it seemed, was being hit all at once, and Sandy Watchers, knowing as ever in his wits sharpened by a frightful blow in the nose, reopened the door and led the rout. The others, following incontinently, were jammed for a moment in the corner by the doorway. The hitting continued. Phipps, the Unitarian, had a front tooth broken, and Enfry was injured in the cartilage of his ear. Jaffers was struck under the jaw, and, turning, caught at something that intervened between him and Huckster in the melee, and prevented their coming together. He felt a muscular chest, and in another moment the whole mass of struggling, excited men shot out into the crowded hall. I got him, shouted Jaffers, choking and reeling through them all, and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy. Men staggered right and left as the extraordinary conflict swayed swiftly towards the house door and went spinning down the half dozen steps of the inn. Jaffers cried in a strangled voice, holding tight, nevertheless, and making play with his knee, spun around, and fell heavily undermost with his head on the gravel. Only then did his fingers relax. There were excited cries of hold him. Invisible, and so forth, and a young fellow, a stranger in the place whose name did not come to light, rushed in at once, caught something, missed his hold, and fell over the constable's prostrate body. Halfway across the road a woman screamed as something pushed by her, a dog, kicked apparently, yelped and ran howling into Huckster's yard, and with that the transit of the invisible man was accomplished. For a space people stood amazed and gesticulating, and then came panic, and scattered them abroad through the village as a gust scatters dead leaves. But Jaffers lay quite still, face upward and knees bent, at the foot of the steps of the inn. Chapter 8 in transit. The eighth chapter is exceedingly brief and relates that Gibbons, the amateur naturalist of the district, while lying out on the spacious open downs without a soul within a couple of miles of him, as he thought, and almost dozing, heard close to him the sound as of a man coughing, sneezing, and then swearing savagely to himself, and looking, beyond nothing. Yet the voice was indisputable. It continued to swear with that breadth and variety that distinguishes the swearing of a cultivated man. It grew to a climax, 
diminished again and died away in the distance, going as it seemed to him in the direction of Aterdean. It lifted to a spasmodic sneeze and ended. Gibbons had heard nothing of the morning's occurrences, but the phenomenon was so striking and disturbing that his philosophical tranquility vanished. He got up hastily and hurried down the steepness of the hill towards the village as fast as he could go. Chapter 9 Mr. Thomas Marvel You must picture Mr. Thomas Marvel as a person of copious, flexible visage, a nose of cylindrical protrusion, a licorice, ample, fluctuating mouth, and a beard of bristling eccentricity. His figure inclined to Ambang Pong, his short limbs accentuated this inclination. He wore a furry silk hat, and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons apparent at critical points of his costume marked a man essentially bachelor. Mr. Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside over the down towards Aterdean, about a mile and a half out of Iping. His feet, save for socks of irregular open work, were bare, his big toes were broad and pricked like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner, he did everything in a leisurely manner. He was contemplating trying on a pair of boots. They were the soundest boots he had come across for a long time, but too large for him, whereas the ones he had were, in dry weather, a very comfortable fit, but too thin so for damp. Mr. Thomas Marvel hated roomy shoes, but then he hated damp. He had never properly thought out which he hated most, and it was a pleasant day, and there was nothing better to do. So he put the four shoes in a graceful group on the turf and looked at them. And seeing them there among the grass and springing agrimony, it suddenly occurred to him that both pairs were exceedingly ugly to see. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. Their boots, anyhow, said the voice. Their cherry boots, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with his head on one side regarding them distastefully and which is the ugliest pair in the whole blessed universe. I'm darned if I know. Hum, said the voice. I've worn worse, in fact, I've worn none. But none so audacious ugly, if you'll allow the expression. I've been catching boots, in particular, for days. Because I was sick of them. They're sound enough, of course but a gentleman on tramp sees such a thundering lot of his boots. And if you'll believe me, I've raised nothing in the whole blessed country, try as I would, but them. Look at him. And a good country for boots, too, in a general way. But it's just my promiscuous luck. I've got my boots in this country 10 years or more. And then they treat you like this. It's a beast of a country said the voice. And pigs for people. Ain't it, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Lord, but them boots. It beats it. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to comparisons, and lo, where the boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. Where are you? said Mr. Thomas Marvel over his shoulder and coming on all fours. He saw a stretch of empty downs with the wind swaying the remote green pointed first bushes. Am I drunk? said Mr. Marvel. Have I had visions? Was I talking to myself? What the don't be alarmed, said a voice. None of your ventriloquizing me said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rising sharply to his feet. Where are you? Alarmed, indeed. Don't be alarmed, repeated the voice. You'll be alarmed in a minute, you silly fool, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Where are you? Let me get my mark on you. Are you buried? said Mr. Thomas Marvel, after an interval. There was no answer. Mr. Thomas Marvel stood bootless and amazed, his jacket nearly thrown off. Peewit, said a peewit, very remote. Peewit, indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. 
this ain't no time for foolery. The down was desolate, east and west, north and south. The road with its shallow ditches and white bordering stakes ran smooth and empty north and south, and, save for that peewit, the blue sky was empty too. So help me, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, shuffling his coat onto his shoulders again. It's the drink. I might not have known. It's not the drink, said the voice. You keep your nerves steady. How, said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. It's the drink, his lips repeated noiselessly. He remained staring about him, rotating slowly backwards. I could have swore I heard a voice, he whispered. Of course you did. It's there again, said Mr. Marvel, closing his eyes and clasping his hand on his brow with a tragic gesture. He was suddenly taken by the collar and shaken violently and left more dazed than ever. Don't be a fool, said the voice. I'm off my blooming chump, said Mr. Marvel. It's no good. It's fretting about them blarsted boots. I'm off my blessed blooming chump. Or it's spirits. Neither one thing nor the other, said the voice. Listen. Chump, said Mr. Marvel. One minute, said the voice, penetratingly, tremulous with self-control. Well, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with a strange feeling of having been dug in the chest by a finger. You think I'm just imagination? Just imagination? What else can you be, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rubbing the back of his neck. Very well said the voice in a tone of relief. Then I'm going to throw flints at you till you think differently. But where are you? The voice made no answer. Whiz came a flint apparently out of the air and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Mr. Marvel, turning, saw flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, and then fling at his feet with almost invisible rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Was it came and ricocheted from a bare toe into the ditch. Mr. Thomas Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. Then he started to run, tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came head over heels into a sitting position. Now, said the voice, as a third stone curved upward and hung in the air above the tramp. Am I imagination? Mr. Marvel, by way of reply, struggled to his feet and was immediately rolled over again. He lay quiet for a moment. If you struggle any more, said the voice, I shall throw the flint at your head. It's a fair do, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand and fixing his eye on the third missile. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves. Stones talking. Put yourself down. Rot away. I'm done. The third flint fell. It's very simple, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Tell us something I don't know, said Mr. Marvel, gasping with pain. Where you've hit, how you do it, I don't know. I'm beat. That's all, said the voice. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. Anyone could see that. There is no need for you to be so confounded and patient, mister. Now then, give us a notion. How are you hit? I'm invisible. That's the great point. And what I want you to understand is this, but whereabouts interrupted Mr. Marvel. Here, six yards in front of you. Oh, come. I ain't blind. You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I am thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Foxy T, what is it, Jabber? Is it that? I am just a human being, solid, needing food and drink, 
needing covering too, but I'm invisible. You see? Invisible. Simple idea. Invisible. What, real like? Yes, real. Let's have a hand of you, said Marvel, if you are real. It won't be so darn out of the way like, then, Lord, he said, how you made me jump, gripping me like that. He felt the hand that had closed round his wrist with his disengaged fingers, and his fingers went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest, and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. I'm dashed, he said. If this don't beat cockfighting. Most remarkable, and there I can see a rabbit clean through you, half a mile away. Not a bit of you visible, except... He scrutinized the apparently empty space keenly. You even been eating bread and cheese? He asked, holding the invisible arm. You're quite right, and it's not quite assimilated into the system. Ah, said Mr. Marvel. Sort of ghostly, though. Of course, all this isn't half so wonderful as you think. It's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. How'd you manage it? How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story. And besides, I tell you, the whole business fairly beats me, said Mr. Marvel. What I want to say at present is this, I need help. I have come to that, I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered. And I saw you, Lord, said Mr. Marvel. I came up behind you, hesitated, went on, Mr. Marvel's expression was eloquent. Then stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. So I turned back and came to you, you. And, Lord, said Mr. Marvel. But I'm all in a tizzy. May I ask, how is it? and what you may be requiring in the way of help, invisible. I want you to help me get clothes, and shelter, and then, with other things. I've left them long enough. If you won't, well, but you will, must. Look here, said Mr. Marvel. I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about any more, and leave me go. I must get steady a bit, and you've pretty near broken my toe. It's all so unreasonable. Empty downs, empty sky. Nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature. And then comes a voice. A voice out of heaven. And stones. And a fist, Lord. Pull yourself together, said the voice for you have to do the job I've chosen for you. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were round. I've chosen you, said the voice. You are the only man except some of those fools down there who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power. He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you, he paused and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you, said Mr. Marvel, edging away from the direction of the fingers. Don't you go a thinking that, whatever you do. All I want to do is to help you, just tell me what I got to do. Lord, whatever you want done, that I'm most willing to do. Chapter 10 Mr. Marvel's Visit to E-Pin After the first gusty panic had spent itself, Iping became argumentative. Skepticism suddenly reared its head, rather nervous skepticism, not at all assured of its back, but skepticism nevertheless. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air or felt the strength of his arm could be counted on the fingers of two hands.
and of these witnesses Mr. Watchers was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house, and Jaffers was lying stunned in the parlor of the coach and horses. Great and strange ideas transcending experience often have less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Iping was gay with bunting, and everybody was in gala dress. Wood Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion on the supposition that he had quite gone away, and with the skeptics he was already a jest. But people, skeptics and believers alike, were remarkably sociable all that day. Hazman's meadow was gay with a tent in which Mrs. Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea, while, without, the Sunday school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs. Cuss and Sackbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air but people for the most part had the sense to conceal whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green an inclined strong, down which, clinging the while to a pulley swung handle, one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other end, came in for considerable favor among the adolescent, as also did the swings and the coconut shies. There was also promenading, and the steam organ attached to a small roundabout filled the air with a pungent flavor of oil and with equally pungent music. Members of the club, who had attended church in the morning, were splendid in badges of pink and green, and some of the gayer minded had also adorned their bowler hats with brilliant colored favors of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose conceptions of holiday making were severe, was visible through the jasmine about his window or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look, poised delicately on plank supported on two chairs and whitewashing the ceiling of his front room. About four o'clock a stranger entered the village from the direction of the Downs. He was a short, stout person in an extraordinarily shabby top hat and he appeared to be very much out of breath. His cheeks were alternately limp and tightly puffed. His mild face was apprehensive and he moved with a sort of reluctant alacrity. He turned the corner of the church and directed his way to the coach and horses. Among others old Fletcher remembers seeing him and indeed the old gentleman was so struck by his peculiar agitation that he inadvertently allowed a quantity of whitewash to run down the brush into the sleeve of his coat while regarding him. This stranger, to the perceptions of the proprietor of the coconut shy, appeared to be talking to himself and Mr. Huckster remarked the same thing. He stopped at the foot of the coach and horse's steps and, according to Mr. Huckster, appeared to undergo a severe internal struggle before he could induce himself to enter the house. Finally, he marched up the steps and was seen by Mr. Huckster to turn to the left and open the door of the parlor. Mr. Huckster heard voices from within the room and from the bar apprising the man of his error. That room's private, said Hall, and the stranger shut the door clumsily and went into the bar. In the course of a few minutes he reappeared, wiping his lips with the back of his hand with an air of quiet satisfaction that somehow impressed Mr. Huckster as assumed. He stood looking about him for some moments, and then Mr. Huckster saw him walk in an oddly furtive manner towards the gates of the yard upon which the parlor window opened. The stranger, after some hesitation, went against one of the gate posts, produced a short clay pipe and prepared to fill it. His fingers trembled while doing so. He lit it clumsily and folding his arms began to smoke in a languid attitude, an attitude which his occasional glances up the yard altogether belied. All this Mr. Huckster saw over the canisters of the tobacco window and the singularity of the man's behavior prompted him to maintain his observation. Presently the stranger stood up abruptly and put his pipe in his pocket. Then he vanished into the yard. Forthwith Mr. Huckster, conceiving he was witness of some petty larceny, leapt round his counter and ran out into the road to intercept the thief. As he did so, Mr. Marvel reappeared, his hat askew, a big bundle and a blue tablecloth in one hand, and three books tied together, as it proved afterwards with the vicar's braces, in the other.
directly he saw Huckster he gave a sort of gasp and turning sharply to the left, began to run. Stop, thief, cried Huckster and set off after him. Mr. Huckster's sensations were vivid but brief. He saw the man just before him and spurring briskly for the church corner and the hill road. He saw the village flags and festivities beyond and a face or so turned towards him. He bawled, stop, again. He had hardly gone ten strides before his shin was caught in some mysterious fashion and he was no longer running but flying with inconceivable rapidity through the air. He saw the ground suddenly close to his face. The world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light and subsequent proceedings interested him no more. Chapter 11 In the Coach and Horses Now in order clearly to understand what had happened in the inn, it is necessary to go back to the moment when Mr. Marvel first came into view of Mr. Huckster's window. At that precise moment Mr. Cuss and Mr. Bunting were in the parlor. They were seriously investigating the strange occurrences of the morning and were, with Mr. Hall's permission, making a thorough examination of the invisible man's belongings. Jaffers had partially recovered from his fall and had gone home in the charge of his sympathetic friends. The stranger's scattered garments had been removed by Mrs. Hall and the room tied up. And on the table under the window where the stranger had been wont to work, Cuss had hit almost at once on three big books and manuscript labeled Diary. Diary, said Cuss, putting the three books on the table. Now, at any rate, we shall learn something. The vicar stood with his hands on the table. Diary, repeated Cuss, sitting down, putting two volumes to support the third and opening it. Um, no name on the flyleaf. Bother, cipher. And figures. The vicar came round to look over his shoulder. Cuss turned the pages over with a face suddenly disappointed. I'm, dear me. It's all cipher, Bunting. There are no diagrams, asked Mr. Bunting. No illustrations throwing light, see for yourself, said Mr. Cuss. Some of it's mathematical and some of it's Russian or some such language to judge by the letters and some of it's Greek. Now the Greek I thought you, of course, said Mr. Bunting, taking out and wiping his spectacles and feeling suddenly very uncomfortable for he had no Greek left in his mind worth talking about. Yes, the Greek, of course, may furnish a clue. I'll find you a place. I'd rather glance through the volumes first said Mr. Bunting, still wiping. A general impression first, cuss, and then, you know, we can go looking for clues. He coughed, put on his glasses, arranged them fastidiously, coughed again, and wished something would happen to avert the seemingly inevitable exposure. Then he took the volume cuss handed him in a leisurely manner. And then something did happen. The door opened suddenly. Both gentlemen started violently, looked round, and were relieved to see a sporadically rosy face beneath a furry silk hat. Tap, asked the face, and stood staring. No, said both gentlemen at once. Over the other side, my man, said Mr. Bunting. And please shut that door, said Mr. Cuss, irritably. All right, said the intruder as it seemed in a low voice curiously different from the huskiness of its first inquiry. Right you are, said the intruder in the former voice. Stand clear, and he vanished and closed the door. A sailor, I should judge, said Mr. Bunting. Amusing fellows, they are. Stand clear. Indeed. A nautical term, referring to his getting back out of the room, I suppose. I dare say so, said Cuss. My nerves are all loose today. It quite made me jump, the door opening like that. Mr. Bunting smiled as if he had not jumped. And now, he said with a sigh, these books. Someone sniffed as he did so. One thing is indisputable, said Bunting, 
drawing up a chair next to that of Gus. There certainly have been very strange things happen in Iping during the last few days, very strange. I cannot of course believe in this absurd invisibility story, it's incredible, said Cus, incredible. But the fact remains that I saw, I certainly saw right down his sleeve, but did you, are you sure? Suppose a mirror, for instance, hallucinations are so easily produced. I don't know if you have ever seen a really good conjurer, I won't argue again, said Cus. We've thrashed that out, bunting. And just now there's these books, ah. Here's some of what I take to be Greek. Greek letters, certainly. He pointed to the middle of the page. Mr. Bunting flushed slightly and brought his face nearer, apparently finding some difficulty with his glasses. Suddenly he became aware of a strange feeling at the nape of his neck. He tried to raise his head and encountered an immovable resistance. The feeling was a curious pressure, the grip of a heavy, firm hand, and it bore his chin irresistibly to the table. Don't move, little man, whispered a voice, or I'll bring you both. He looked into the face of Cus, close to his own, and each saw a horrified reflection of his own sickly astonishment. I'm sorry to handle you so roughly, said the voice, but it's unavoidable. Since when did you learn to pry into an investigator's private memoranda, said the voice, and two chins struck the table simultaneously, and two sets of teeth rattled. Since when did you learn to invade the private rooms of a man in misfortune, and the concussion was repeated? Where have they put my clothes? Listen, said the voice. The windows are fastened and I've taken the key out of the door. I am a fairly strong man, and I have the poker handy, besides being invisible. There's not the slightest doubt that I could kill you both and get away quite easily if I wanted to, do you understand? Very well. If I let you go, will you promise not to try any nonsense and do what I tell you? The vicar and the doctor looked at one another, and the doctor pulled a face. Yes, said Mr. Bunting, and the doctor repeated it. Then the pressure on the necks relaxed, and the doctor and the vicar sat up, both very red in the face and wriggling their heads. Please keep sitting where you are, said the invisible man, here's the poker, you see. When I came into this room, continued the invisible man, after presenting the poker to the tip of the nose of each of his visitors, I did not expect to find it occupied, and I expected to find, in addition to my books of memoranda, an outfit of clothing. Where is it? No, don't rise. I can see it's gone. Now, just at present, though the days are quite warm enough for an invisible man to run about stark, the evenings are quite chilly. I want clothing and other accommodation, and I must also have those three books. Chapter 12 The Invisible Man Loses His Temper it is unavoidable that at this point the narrative should break off again for a certain very painful reason that will presently be apparent. While these things were going on in the parlor, and while Mr. Huckster was watching Mr. Marvel smoking his pipe against the gate, not a dozen yards away were Mr. Hall and Tenny Henfry discussing in a state of cloudy puzzlement the one hyping topic. Suddenly there came a violent thud against the door of the parlor, a sharp cry, and then silence. Hello, said Teddy Henfry. Hello, from the tap. Mr. Hall took things in slowly, but surely. That ain't right, he said, and came round from behind the bar towards the parlor door. He and Teddy approached the door together, with intent faces. Their eyes considered. Some at wrong, said Hall, and Henfry nodded agreement. Whiffs of an unpleasant chemical odor met them, and there was a muffled sound of conversation, very rapid and subdued. You all right Thursday? asked Hall, rapping. The muttered conversation ceased abruptly, for a moment silence, then the conversation was resumed, in hissing whispers, then a sharp cry of no. No, you don't. There came a sudden motion and the oversetting of a chair, 
a brief struggle. Silence again. What the does, explained Henfry, Sato Voci. You all right Thursday? Asked Mr. Hall, sharply, again. The vicar's voice answered with a curious jerking intonation, quite rewrite. Please don't interrupt. Odd, said Mr. Henfry. Odd, said Mr. Hall. Says, don't interrupt, said Henfry. I hear it in, said Hall. And a sniff, said Henfry. They remained listening. The conversation was rapid and subdued. I can't, said Mr. Bunting, his voice rising. I tell you, sir, I will not. What was that? asked Henfry. Says he why not, said Hall. Weren't speaking to us, was he? Disgraceful, said Mr. Bunting, within. Disgraceful, said Mr. Henfry. I heard it, distinct. Who's that speaking now? asked Henfry. Mr. Cuss, I suppose, said Hall. Can you hear anything? Silence. The sounds within indistinct and perplexing. Sounds like throwing the tablecloth about, said Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared behind the bar. Hall made gestures of silence and invitation. This aroused Mrs. Hall's wifely opposition. Will you listen in there for, Hall? She asked. Ain't you nothing better to do, busy day like this? Hall tried to convey everything by grimaces and dumb show, but Mrs. Hall was obdurate. She raised her voice. So Hall and Enfry, rather crestfallen, tiptoed back to the bar, gesticulating to explain to her. At first she refused to see anything in what they had heard at all. Then she insisted on Hall keeping silence while Enfry told her his story. She was inclined to think the whole business nonsense, perhaps they were just moving the furniture about. I heard him say disgraceful that I did, said Hall. I hear that, Mrs. Hall, said Enfry. Like as not, began Mrs. Hall. HSH, said Mr. Teddy Enfry. Didn't I hear the window? What window? asked Mrs. Hall. Parlor window, said Enfry. Everyone stood listening intently. Mrs. Hall's eyes, directed straight before her, saw without seeing the brilliant oblong of the inn door, the road white and vivid, and Huckster's shop front blistering in the June sun. Abruptly Huckster's door opened and Huckster appeared, eyes staring with excitement, arms gesticulating. Yap, cried Huckster. Stop thief, and he ran obliquely across the oblong towards the yard gates, and vanished. Simultaneously came a tumult from the parlor, and a sound of windows being closed. Paul, Enfry, and the human contents of the tap rushed out at once pell-mell into the street. They saw someone whisk round the corner towards the road, and Mr. Huckster executing a complicated leap in the air that ended on his face and shoulder. Down the street people were standing astonished or running towards them. Mr. Huckster was stunned. Enfry stopped to discover this, but Hall and the two laborers from the tap rushed at once to the corner, shouting incoherent things, and saw Mr. Marvel vanishing by the corner of the church wall. They appear to have jumped to the impossible conclusion that this was the invisible man suddenly become visible and set off at once along the lane in pursuit. But Hall had hardly run a dozen yards before he gave a loud shout of astonishment and went flying headlong sideways, clutching one of the laborers and bringing him to the ground. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second laborer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tumbled over of his own accord, turned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as Huckster had been. Then, as the first laborer shriveled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village green came round the corner. The first to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in a blue jersey.
He was astonished to see the lane empty save for three men sprawling absurdly on the ground. And then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of overhasty people. Now when Hall and Enfry and the laborers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar next to the till. And suddenly the parlor door was opened, and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her rushed at once down the steps toward the corner. Hold him, he cried. Don't let him drop that parcel. He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel. For the invisible man had handed over the books and bundle in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute, but his costume was defective, a sort of limp white kilt that could only have passed muster in Greece. Hold him, he bawled. He's got my trousers. And every stitch of the vicar's clothes. Tend to him in a minute, he cried to Enfry as he passed the prostrate huckster, and, coming round the corner to join the tumult, was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet, was knocked against and thrown on all fours again, and became aware that he was involved not in a capture, but a rout. Everyone was running back to the village. He rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. He staggered and set off back to the coach and horses forthwith, leaping over the deserted huckster, who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him as he was halfway up the end steps he heard a sudden yell of rage, rising sharply out of the confusion of cries, and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognized the voice as that of the invisible man, and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. In another moment Mr. Cuss was back in the parlor. He's coming back, bunting, he said, rushing in. Save yourself. Mr. Bunting was standing in the window engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearthrug in a West Surrey Gazette. Who's coming, he said, so startled that his costume nearly escaped disintegration. Invisible man, said Cuss, and rushed onto the window. We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad. Mad. In another moment he was out in the yard. Good heavens, said Mr. Bunting, hesitating between two horrible alternatives. He heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. From the moment when the invisible man screamed with rage and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up the village, it became impossible to give a consecutive account of affairs in Iping. Possibly the invisible man's original intention was simply to cover Marvel's retreat with the clothes and books. But his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks and two chairs, with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush has passed and the iping street with its gods and flags is deserted save for the still raging unseen and littered with coconuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock and tray of a sweet stuff stall. Everywhere there is a sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while by breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street lamp through the parlor window of Mrs. Gribble. He must have been who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdean just beyond Higgins Cottage on the Adderdean Road. And after that, as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions altogether, and he was neither heard 
seen, nor felt an iping anymore. He vanished absolutely. But it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of Iping Street. Chapter 13 Mr. Marvel discusses his resignation. When the dusk was gathering and Iping was just beginning to peep timorously forth again upon the shattered wreckage of its bank holiday, a short, thick-set man in a shabby silk hat was marching painfully through the twilight behind the beech woods on the road to Bramblehurst. He carried three books bound together by some sort of ornamental elastic ligature and a bundle wrapped in a blue tablecloth. His rubicund face expressed consternation and fatigue, he appeared to be in a spasmodic sort of hurry. He was accompanied by a voice other than his own, and ever and again he winced under the touch of unseen hands. If you give me this slip again, said the voice, if you attempt to give me this slip again, Lord, said Mr. Marvel. That shoulder's a mass of bruises as it is. On my honor, said the voice, I will kill you. I didn't try to give you the slip, said Marvel, in a voice that was not far remote from tears. I swear I didn't. I didn't know the blessed turning, that was all. How the devil was I to know the blessed turning? As it is, I've been knocked about, you'll get knocked about a great deal more if you don't mind, said the voice, and Mr. Marvel abruptly became silent. He blew on his cheeks, and his eyes were eloquent of despair. It's bad enough to let these floundering yokels explode my little secret without your cutting off with my books. It's lucky for some of them they cut and ran when they did. Here am I. No one knew I was invisible. And now what am I to do? What am I to do? Asked Marvel, Savovoci. It's all about. It will be in the papers. Everybody will be looking for me, everyone on their guard, the voice broke off into vivid curses and ceased. The despair of Mr. Marvel's face deepened, and his pace slackened. Go on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel's face assumed a grayish tint between the ruddier patches. Don't drop those books, stupid, said the voice, sharply, overtaking him. The fact is, said the voice, I shall have to make use of you. You're a poor tool, but I must. I'm a miserable tool, said Marvel. You are, said the voice. I'm the worst possible tool you could have, said Marvel. I'm not strong, he said after a discouraging silence. I'm not over strong, he repeated. No. And my heart's weak. That little business, I pulled it through, of course, but bless you. I could have dropped. Well, I haven't the nerve and strength for the sort of thing you want. I'll stimulate you. I wish you wouldn't. I wouldn't like to mess up your plans, you know. But I might, out of sheer funk and misery. You'd better not, said the voice, with quiet emphasis. I wish I was dead, said Marvel. It ain't justice, he said, you must admit. It seems to me I've a perfect right, get on, said the voice. Mr. Marvel mended his pace, and for a time they went in silence again. It's devilish hard, said Mr. Marvel. This was quite ineffectual. He tried another tack. What do I make by it? He began again in a tone of unendurable wrong. Oh. Shut up, said the voice with sudden amazing vigor. I'll see to you all right. You do what you're told. You'll do it all right. You're a fool and all that, but you'll do. I tell you, sir, I'm not the man for it. Respectfully, but it is so. If you don't shut up, I shall twist your wrist again, said the invisible man I want to think. Presently, two oblongs of yellow light appeared through the trees, and the square tower of a church loomed through the gloaming. I shall keep my hand on your shoulder, said the voice, all through the village. Go straight through and try no foolery. It will be the worst for you if you do.
I know that, sighed Mr. Marvel. I know all that. The unhappy looking figure in the obsolete silk hat passed up the street of the little village with his burdens and vanished into the gathering darkness beyond the lights of the windows. Chapter 14 At Port Stowe 10 o'clock the next morning found Mr. Marvel, unshaven, dirty, and travel-stained, sitting with the books beside him and his hands deep in his pockets, looking very weary, nervous, and uncomfortable, and inflating his cheeks at infrequent intervals on the bench outside a little inn on the outskirts of Port Stowe. Beside him were the books, but now they were tied with string. The bundle had been abandoned in the pine woods beyond Bramblehurst, in accordance with a change in the plans of the invisible man Mr. Marvel sat on the bench, and although no one took the slightest notice of him, his agitation remained at fever heat. His hands would go ever and again to his various pockets with a curious nervous fumbling. When he had been sitting for the best part of an hour, however, an elderly mariner, carrying a newspaper, came out of the inn and sat down beside him. Pleasant day, said the mariner. Mr. Marvel glanced about him with something very like terror. Very, he said. Just seasonable weather for the time of year, said the mariner, taking no denial. Quite, said Mr. Marvel. The mariner produced a toothpick and, saving his regard, was engrossed thereby for some minutes. His eyes meanwhile were at liberty to examine Mr. Marvel's dusty figure and the books beside him. As he had approached Mr. Marvel, he had heard a sound like the dropping of coins into a pocket. He was struck by the contrast of Mr. Marvel's appearance with this suggestion of opulence. Thence his mind wandered back again to a topic that had taken a curiously firm hold of his imagination. Books, he said suddenly, noisily finishing with the toothpick. Mr. Marvel started and looked at them. Oh, yes, he said. Yes, they're books. There's some extraordinary things in books, said the mariner. I believe you, said Mr. Marvel. And some extraordinary things out of them, said the mariner. True likewise, said Mr. Marvel. He had his interlocutor and then glanced about him. There's some extraordinary things in newspapers, for example, said the mariner. There are. In this newspaper, said the mariner. Ah, said Mr. Marvel. There's a story, said the mariner, fixing Mr. Marvel with an eye that was firm and deliberate. There's a story about an invisible man, for instance. Mr. Marvel pulled his mouth askew and scratched his cheek and felt his ears glowing. What will they be writing next? He asked faintly. Austria or America? Neither said the mariner. Here. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, starting. When I say here, said the mariner, to Mr. Marvel's intense relief, I don't of course mean here in this place, I mean hereabouts. An invisible man, said Mr. Marvel. And what's he been up to? Everything, said the mariner, controlling Marvel with his eye, and then amplifying every blessed thing. I ain't seen a paper these four days, said Marvel. I think's the place he started it, said the mariner. Indeed, said Mr. Marvel. He started there. And where he came from, nobody don't seem to know. Here it is, peculiar story from Iping. And it says in this paper that the evidence is extraordinary strong, extraordinary. Lord, said Mr. Marvel. But then, it's an extraordinary story. There is a clergyman and a medical gent witnesses saw him all right and proper, or leastways didn't see him. He was staying, it says, at the coach and horses, and no one don't seem to have been aware of his misfortune, it says, aware of his misfortune, until an altercation in the inn, it says, his bandages on his head was torn off. It was then Obeserf that his head was invisible. Attempts were at once made to secure him, but casting off his garments, it says, he succeeded in escaping, 
but not until after a desperate struggle in which he had inflicted serious injuries, it says, on our worthy and able constable, Mr. J. Uh, Jaffers. Pretty straight story, eh? Names and everything. Lord, said Mr. Marvel, looking nervously about him, trying to count the money in his pockets by his unaided sense of touch, and full of a strange and novel idea. It sounds most astonishing. Don't it? Extraordinary, I call it. Never heard tell of invisible men before, I haven't, but nowadays one hears such a lot of extraordinary things that, that all he did, asked Marvel, trying to seem at his ease. It's enough, ain't it, said the mirror. Didn't go back by any chance, asked Marvel. Just escaped and that's all, eh? All, said the mariner. Why, ain't it enough? Quite enough, said Marvel. I should think it was enough, said the mariner. I should think it was enough. He didn't have any pals. It don't say he had any pals, does it? Asked Mr. Marvel, anxious. Ain't one of the sort enough for you? Asked the mariner. No, thank heaven, as one might say, he didn't. He nodded his head slowly. It makes me regular uncomfortable, the bare thought of that chap running about the country. He is at present at large, and from certain evidence it is supposed that he has taken, took, I suppose they mean, the road to Port Stowe. You see we're right in it. None of your American wonders, this time. And just think of the things he might do. Where'd you be? if he took a drop over and above, and had a fancy to go for you. Suppose he wants to rob, who can prevent him? He can trespass, he can burgle, he could walk through a cordon of policemen as easy as me where you could give the slip to a blind man. Easier. For these here blind chaps here uncommon sharp, I'm told. And wherever there was liquor he fancied, he's got a tremendous advantage, Certainly, said Mr. Marvel. And, well, you're right, said the mariner. He has. All this time Mr. Marvel had been glancing about him intently, listening for faint footfalls, trying to detect imperceptible movements. He seemed on the point of some great resolution. He coughed behind his hand. He looked about him again, listened, bent towards the mirror, and lowered his voice, the fact of it is, I happen, to know just a thing or two about this invisible man. From private sources. Oh, said the mariner, interested. You? Yes, said Mr. Marvel. Me. Indeed, said the mariner. And may I ask, you'll be astonished, said Mr. Marvel behind his hand. It's tremendous. Indeed, said the mariner. The fact is, began Mr. Marvel eagerly in a confidential undertone. Suddenly his expression changed marvelously. Ow, he said. He rose stiffly in his seat. His face was eloquent of physical suffering. Wow, he said. What's up, said the mariner, concerned. Toothache, said Mr. Marvel and put his hand to his ear. He caught hold of his books. I must be getting on, I think, he said. He edged in a curious way along the seat away from his interlocutor. But you was just a going to tell me about this here invisible man, protested the mirror. Mr. Marvel seemed to consult with himself. Hoax, said a voice. It's a hoax, said Mr. Marvel. But it's in the paper, said the mariner. Hoax all the same, said Marvel. I know the chap that started the lie. There ain't no invisible man whatsoever, blimey. But how about this paper? Do you mean to say? Not a word of it, said Marvel, stoutly. The mariner stared, paper in hand. Mr. Marvel jerkily faced about. Wait a bit said the mirror, rising and speaking slowly, do you mean to say? 
I do, said Mr. Marvel. Then why did you let me go on and tell you all this blarsted stuff, then? What do you mean by letting a man make a fool of himself like that for? Eh? Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks. The mirror was suddenly very red indeed, he clenched his hands. I've been talking here this ten minutes, he said, and you, you little pot-bellied, leathery-faced son of an old boot, couldn't have the elementary manners, don't you come bandying words with me, said Mr. Marvel. Bandying words? I'm a jolly good mind, come up, said a voice, and Mr. Marvel was suddenly whirled about and started marching off in a curious spasmodic manner. You better move on, said the mariner. Who's moving on, said Mr. Marvel. He was receding obliquely with a curious hurrying gait, with occasional violent jerks forward. Some way along the road he began a muttered monologue, protests and recriminations. Silly devil, said the mariner, legs wide apart, elbows akimbo, watching the receding figure. I'll show you, you silly ass, hoaxing me. It's here, on the paper. Mr. Marvel retorted incoherently and, receding, was hidden by a bend in the road, but the mariner still stood magnificent in the midst of the way until the approach of a butcher's cart dislodged him. Then he turned himself towards Port Stowe. Full of extraordinary asses, he said softly to himself. Just to take me down a bit, that was his silly game, it's on the paper. And there was another extraordinary thing he was presently to hear, that had happened quite close to him. And that was a vision of a fist full of money, no less, traveling without visible agency, along by the wall at the corner of St. Michael's Lane. A brother mariner had seen this wonderful sight that very morning. He had snatched at the money forthwith and had been knocked headlong, and when he had got to his feet the butterfly money had vanished. Our mariner was in the mood to believe anything, he declared, but that was a bit too stiff. Afterwards, however, he began to think things over. The story of the flying money was true and all about that neighborhood, even from the August London and Country Banking Company, from the tills of shops and inns, doors standing that sunny weather entirely open, money had been quietly and dexterously making off that day in handfuls and rouleaus, floating quietly along by walls and shady places, dodging quickly from the approaching eyes of men. And it had, though no man had traced it, invariably ended its mysterious flight in the pocket of that agitated gentleman in the obsolete silk hat, sitting outside the little inn on the outskirts of Port Stowe. It was ten days after, and indeed only when the burdock story was already old, that the mariner collated these facts and began to understand how near he had been to the wonderful invisible man, 